Welcome to the uh, robotics seminar. I am so excited to present Guy Hoffman. I've met Guy Hoffman probably uh, 10 years ago when I was doing my PhD and taking a course at Tel Aviv University. And I was intrigued about all the beautiful algorithms that uh, robots allow us to develop. Then Guy came and gave, probably you don't remember that guy, but you gave a guest lecture talk at, at Dan Halpern's course in, in Tel Aviv University. Remember and that. you showed, for me, it was a beautiful and amazing new site, robotics, not the algorithmic engineering, but the human part of, of robotics and how to make I think you're stuck, or I'm. Yeah. yeah. Of, of human yeah. and robots working together. Um, without further ado, I'd be. I'm excited to hear what guy's going to tell us today about collaborating with robots. And on a personal note, I think we can all uh, send our congratulations to guy. Apparently, he's a, a newborn father uh, yes. to a newborn child. So congratulations, and, and the stage is yours. All right. Thanks, Oren. Thanks for inviting me. Um, hi, everybody. I'm sorry I, I can't do this in person, but hopefully it's the last time that we don't do this in person. Uh, next, next year or next time, we will meet in, uh, in a room together. I don't know. I, I, I miss that. Um, I want to talk today about... Um, some new research from my, my lab. Um, the lecture is called Designing Robots for Collaboration, which is what I've been um, doing for many years, probably over 15 years now. Um, and the second half is Collaborating with Robots for Design, which is my new passion for the last three years or so. Um, it's my personal human-robot interaction grand challenge. Can we use robots to help us design complex systems? Um, I'm calling you from uh, Cornell University, which is in Ithaca, New York. This is uh, sort of the view from my window. Um, it's a beautiful campus on a hill overlooking a 100 kilometer long lake. Um, definitely recommended to visit between June and August because the rest. Um, so this is what it looks like when I walk to work. I walk along this waterfall, but between August and June, it looks like this most of the time. So you, you better you should come during the summer. Um, the work that I'm presenting is uh, coming from my, my lab, which is called the Human Robot Collaboration and Companionship Lab, HRC squared. Uh, it is the the effort of um, uh, many of my uh, PhD students, uh, current and faded um, past students. Um, I'll up here on the left middle just got married last night so i was i was actually watching um his wedding in india happening at uh, 1 a.m last night to this tonight um we've been thinking about human robot collaboration which is uh, mostly what i think about the robot that works with a person in the in a professional settings but also human robot companionship which is a situation where the robot works with the human in a, in a personal setting um and a few years ago i tried to sort of define the, the um, mission for my lab. I saw this in, in Danielle Woods, who was a researcher at MIT, and she, she had a, a mission for her lab. I thought I should have a mission for my lab because I think it really focuses the kinds of projects um, we want to engage in. And, I, and the mission that, that, uh, that I came up with is that, that the mission of the lab is to understand the interplay between human behaviors, attitudes, and needs, and personal robotic technology. So personal is like one person, one robot generally in order to design robots that best support the human values that we want to um, promote. We do this using three main methodologies. Uh, first is AI, which has become kind of like a very um, loaded and close to useless term these days, but I'll explain what I mean by this in our context. The second is design, both uh, design from a perspective of, um, of uh, design thinking, industrial design, or any type of the design that you might think of uh, in a colloquial way, but also mechanical design and, and you know, the kinematics and dynamics that have to do with that. And the third is human-machine interaction, which is uh, sort of my 
overarching term of um, um, more like social science studies or, or psychology studies around humans and robots working together. So this is also maps well on, on the my appointments at Cornell uh, are in, in uh, uh, computer science, mechanical engineering, and information science, and this sort of maps well into these three different topics. And, and in, in some projects, we use two or more of these uh, methodologies. But these are the types of things we do. We run studies that we analyze with people in the lab. We develop algorithms, and we de we de design and build robots. Um, the way I want to structure this is I want to do a brief overview of um, sort of an. Uh, the types of projects we do in each of these three and, and one highlight one of the projects and then speak for uh, most of my talk. And, and so will this be 45 minutes or an hour? What, what, is, what, what should I aim for? Okay. Right. An hour including questions. Okay. So I want to talk for the last maybe 20 minutes or so of, of one project that includes all three of these, which is this project of collaborating with robots for design. Um, in the topic of AI, um, we've been mostly working on a variety of probabilistic models. Um, um, so in the past, looking more at, at, at different models for, for collaboration, like uh, two-agent MDPs, uh, macro decision processes, uh, but also more, more uh, sort of cognitively inspired works like uh, activation networks. Uh, in my work at Georgia Tech as a postdoc with Professor Weinberg, um, uh, we were working uh, a lot on improvisation models and what does it mean to improvise. And obviously, uh, recently, um, a lot of the work has focused on uh, neural networks, where we've uh, looked at neural networks for developing gestures for robots, uh, but also for developing a, a fully sensate um, robotic skin. Um, and our latest publication on this topic is, is sort of an evaluation of, of guided policy search, which is, which is a reinforcement model, reinforcement learning um, uh, method for human robot handovers. And in all of these, I think the, the main point that summarizes this project is that we're really trying to figure out what the, how to model the human within these more traditional and, and often very simplistic um, uh, models of probabilistic reasoning. The project I want to focus on a little bit more as a, as a highlight is, is this project in collaboration with Professor Hadas Kraskazid, who uh, we just discussed with Erez. Um, and this is uh, her, her expertise is in formal methods for, uh, for robotics. And we've been thinking for several years now about this um, idea of formal methods for human robot interaction. So formal methods means uh, in, in the parlance that Hadas and, and others use, um, is basically some sort of a logic based, so a formal logic based, often a specification that can then define the behavior of a robot in a very generic way. Um, there's a paper coming out that sort of sh uh, talks about this vision. I think it's in the next issue of communications of the ACM. It's uh, Hadassah was leading this with a lot of uh, co-authors um, and uh, it's called formalizing and guaranteeing human robot interaction. And this is, um, perhaps a, a, an overview of what, what we mean by this. So in our vision, we would have a robot that has a controller and the, ro the controller is, determines the robot's behavior. The robot, can you see my, my uh, um, arrow as I move? Yeah? yeah? The robot is in some sort of interaction with the human. But importantly, this robot controller is not programmed. It is, used, it is developed using uh, an automatic synthesis. So a software that develops the robot controller. And how does it happen? The human, which is not a, a robotics programmer, it's a, it could be a, a manager on a, on a factory floor, it could be a, um, you know, a policymaker in a, in a hospital. Um, the human will define some high level requirements of the robot. So it will define what the robot needs to, like what are the standards the robot needs to adhere to? What are the safety guarantees the robot has to comply with? These will be translated into formal specifications. So the, these high level uh, requirements will be translated into uh, a set of uh, formal logic um, prepositions. And these prepositions will then be entered into the synthesizer, which is the, the software that takes these specifications using a world model and a model of human behavior to then develop the controller. And then this controller will then be in interaction with the robot. So this is sort of the high level visions it, and, and um, 
And we've uh, demonstrated this with two preliminary works in the last few years, uh, one with the navigation, sort of um, uh, a formal automatically synthesized uh, controller for a robot that can walk with the human, maintaining a certain distance um, from the human at all times. And also for uh, handovers, um, so that the, uh, the um, robot gives an object to a human again. And none of these controls are especially amazing in their performance. But the important thing is, is that these, these controls were developed only by specifying what these controls need to adhere to and, and not, um, and not uh, in any uh, detailed way by, by the programmer. We are now uh, running an experiment with this uh, human robot handover controller, where we have, um, you know, in a timely fashion, we, we made this like vaccine packing factory, where the vaccines have to be, uh, they can't be out of the cooling box for a certain amount of time. So the, the person can specify their requirements of the handovers and of the packing procedure. And then the robot will, um, will uh, uh, use a controller that, that, that adheres to the specification. We're comparing this in this experiment with a, a typical um, um, feedback controller where the human has to specify the different parameters of the feedback controller. So one of the advantages of, of, um, of having formal specifications is that people can specify things in, in, in um, constructs and concepts that make sense to the person. So the person can say, I, I, this has to be in, this can't be out of the cooling box for more than two seconds. Uh, and instead of having to specify this in terms of uh, controller gains or other other types of parameters that may not make sense to people. So you want to compare when people have to program a robot using traditional parameters versus uh, high level specifications. Um, and so far, it seems that the cognitive load does decrease, even though the, the formal uh, specification robots is still um, generally uh, less efficient. The big, the big problem here is this, is this um, human behavior model that I sort of like just put a box in here. But this is one of those things that we really have no good idea on how to do. Like we don't really, this is going to be a recurring theme in my talk. The big problem is that we don't have a good model of human behavior and we, and, and we never had and we, I, I don't know if we ever will. But, uh, but this is kind of the, 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 I think the hard core to crack um, on this. If you want to synthesize a control, you have to make some assumption about what the human is going to do and, and What's that? I mean, we can't even predict our own behavior. Uh, so one of the things that we've, we've, we're proposing in our work is, is this. This is just a, a small, um, I'm looking here on the right, just a small um, extract from a method that we've been looking at, which, which we call iterative human model development through formal models. And basically, I'm going to, I'm going to focus sort of on you start with sort of like a hand-coded human model, but then you keep looking at humans doing the behavior and you keep improving these models by some sort of a supervised learning uh, method. And then at some point you have a human model that you want to test out. And these human models that you test out, you will then take the interaction specification and you will basically have two of you of two virtual humans. So we're gonna, we're gonna learn from things that have been done in reinforcement learning where you have two algorithms sort of playing each other. We we'll basically have two humans, uh, two human model, two of our human models try to behave in the way with each other, and then seeing if if it can uh, if if we can um, ma maintain our our robot controller within the the specification. And then if this is satisfied, we can then synthesize the robot controller. So this is just one direction that we're going to. This is not something that, we, that we've done. So here I'm really showing you this like future vision for our. This is what we put in our grants that have not been funded. This has been so the can, most I, can I still ask project. a question about this? Yeah, I just want to say this has been the most difficult project to fund. Five years of yearly applications and it never gets funded. So this is, we all pay out of this from selling cookies on the campus. <laughs> okay. um, so, so you're trying to learn how humans interact with robots by looking at humans interact with humans, right? But, but no, really, that but might not be the same. It's true. Uh, well, I would say with, with by humans interacting with humans and by robots interacting with robots. We're kind of doing both. The right. thing is, the most expensive thing is to get a human to interact with a robot. You can't like you can't have a million examples of that. Mm -hmm. It's just I mean Google and Apple and, and Amazon can, but that's it. Facebook before they collapse. But um, so yeah, it's true. But we're talking at this point. We're talking about very very simple, like handing over a bottle. 
you know, walking side by side and in the hallway. So I agree with you that it's just not scalable to, you know, how, how I don't know, how somebody will propose marriage to somebody else. But, but, I'm, but, but I think in, in, we're, we're talking about like the basic, you know, the, the picking up a block and putting a bottle on a shelf type of thing. So I think in this, I think there, there, is, there is a horizon here of, of, of progress that we can make in, on these types of tasks. This is my, again, this is a vision. So, I, so this, is, this is what I believe to be true. Thanks. I'm moving on to design. So this is just, again, just a, a, sh a short um, taste, but moving on to design. Um, most of my career, I've been working on designing social robots and um, um, this, it was sort of a little bit opportunistic, but became a, an interest of mine. And I've, um, I've actually been uh, sort of, anyway, I, I've, I've written recently, I've written a paper recently on, on some thoughts on social robot design, um, which was sort of like a little bit more high level and reflective of these, of these years. So this has been, again, almost 15 years. Um, but I want to talk about a new design project that is a little, that is taking a step back and, and is asking a question of uh, what can a robot's skin be? So we're talking specifically about the design of a robot's skin. And, uh, and the insight is that skin uh, for robots is generally very, very limited. So it's often, you know, hard shells of plastic or metal with very limited capabilities. Whereas when you look at the biological skin, you know, our own skin, it's a very sophisticated organ, the largest organ in our body. It regulates our temperature, it uh, enables us to communicate, it, uh, it um, um, has, you know, touch sensing, it can uh, change color. Um, and also other types of skins, architectural skins, clothing skins, all these things are, have such a rich tradition, whereas a robotic skin is really this very degenerate version of, of what a skin can be. Um, so one of those projects is the Blossom Project, which, is, uh, which, had, which came out of the idea to make a robot that people can make their own appearance of the robot, and, and especially using handcraft methods like, uh, like knitting, uh, woodworking. And we ended up... Uh, developing this uh, open access, open source robotics project called Blossom, where you have the basic construction of the robot that you can laser cut and assemble. And, and it comes in at a cost of about $200. Um, and we've had complete novices assemble a, a Blossom in two hours from scratch without ever having done any robotics. So it's, so at least it's a very low bar of entry uh, social robot that you can build for your lab. And then in addition, the the um, exterior of it is completely up to you. So you can, uh, I think I want to, yeah, I'm not going to show the video now because I'm trying to make sure I don't go over time. But the, the idea is that people can, you know, imagine themselves what the robot would look like, add arms in some case, add, you know, ears, uh, and just give the robot a, a skin that is both um, customizable, but also very accessible and very affordable. So, so if you, if you can get some thread or some wool and, and, a, and, a, and a needle, then you don't have to have a 3D printer or uh, um, anything like that to, to design your own robot. This has been kind of making a lot of rounds in the last few years. Uh, so I know of at least five research labs that have their own Blossom robot and each one of them looks differently and has its own kind of um, appearance, but also we've had We've had middle school kids make their own robots, and and, and I think this is sort of an interesting um, direction for uh, for uh, open access uh, social robot interaction. If you are interested in this for you, for your own lab, and we have this website, it's not um, um, you can access all the design files and all the instructions and all the you know software for it, and um, it's called it's called Blossom, but. Um, Going further than just making your own skin, another observation that, that we had was that the most social robots use faces and gestures for expression. So if you look at a social robot, it usually has like a screen with a face and then it has some arms and makes gestures. And a lot of these are, are sort of based on, uh, on um, the literature from the 1960s on, on how, how people communicate, especially going back to Paul Ekman and uh, Michael Argyle and, and these researchers in psychology and, from the 1960s and 70s, but if we look even further back, one of the earliest um, one of the earliest 
writers on emotion expression, which actually he cited quite a lot by Ekman, who is better known in the robotics community, is, is, is Charles Darwin, who has a, a wonderful book called the expression, of, the expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. Um, it has an interesting political background, so I, I encourage you to look it up and to read the book, and it's kind of a nice book, but he says, really the most expressive movement is the uh, erection of the hairs, feathers, and other dermal appendages. So the skin changes is, is the most common way to communicate for animals, um, common throughout three of the great uh, vertebrate classes. So uh, reptiles, um, mammals, and birds exhibit this behavior. And it's kind of the most um, basic emotion expression, much before faces or gestures. Uh, so um, a recent project by, by my grad student, Yuan Hu, and, uh, was to try to develop an active and expressive um, robot skin. And this was done by, uh, by uh, using these fluidic interfaces where, um, uh, in, uh, which were inspired by work by Rob Shepard at, at Cornell um, to try to create these, these different types of skins that have, you know, in this case, goosebumps or spikes or different things you can, you can, uh, you can control. And, and a complex layer of, of interconnected uh, uh, fluid networks underneath that enable you to control them in a, in a, in a more fine-grade matter. matter. <coughs> Yuan has developed a really nice vocabulary. We've, we have a, a paper that's uh, in, in press right now um, on sort of like the design space of, of what you can do with, uh, with, with this basic idea of, of little fluid chambers and channels and how you can use different parameters to create a vocabulary of, of interaction like uh, density and direction. And, um, and it's, it's called, uh, what can a robot skin be? Um, here you can see a small prototype of a robot that uh, you know, has these, uh, these goosebumps that you can uh, hold, you can feel the robot's movement, uh, texture movement. Um, and in this case, we just have two different chambers that are controlled separately, but they can be controlled with frequency and pressure and, and, uh, and, and uh, amplitude. So you can see a little bit of, the, of what it looks like. Um, in HRI in 2019, we published a paper that tried to evaluate whether this is actually a, a readable communication channel for, um, for robots. And, and we found um, quite stark uh, results where people were very consistent and here again, here in this graph, you can see, for example, um, at, on the x-axis, you see in this top graphs on the x-axis, um, you see different uh, design parameters, like uh, in this case, GLH means goosebumps, low frequency, high amplitude. And you can see how this was um, very consistently detected as a calm uh, behavior. And we, we tested three different, um, three different ways of experiencing these, uh, these texture gestures. Um, one was to watch them on a video screen, like it, just like you did. The other one was to watch them in person, which we call observe. And the third one was to touch the, the, the robot without looking at it. So we had, we, we had them close their eyes and just touch the robot. And especially with the in, the in person, you know, touching and observing, it was very, very consistent um, the way that um, people understood these gestures. So on, on the bottom here, you can see if we control the gestures with the GLL, pattern. So again, goosebumps, low frequency, low amplitude. It was consistently seen as a sleepy uh, gesture. So the closer these dots are together, the more, uh, the more they, uh, they co-occur in people's evaluation. This was a test uh, that we did with, uh, I think, 120 participants. Um, and we were surprised by how, how consistent people were with understanding these, um, these skin gestures, um, which indicates that it's really something, even though that, you know, humans don't have such an expressive skin. We have goosebumps, we have flushing, uh, we have temperature changes, uh, I guess because it's such a, it's such a basic um, animal behavior that people are still very attuned to these changes in textures as a, as a way to express emotions. Another side of this project is, is taking this, uh, this soft uh, skin and thinking about um, the skin as a, as a full body touch sensor. So generally full body touch sensors have been attempted, but not very successfully achieved. Um, the most complex of these was actually by a graduate student in the lab that I was as a, as a grad student who worked on this for many years. 
and used thousands of, of uh, force, temperature, and uh, capacitive sensors across the body of a robot and still got only a, uh, about a, a one centimeter resolution. You have to imagine that's the amount of wiring that goes into covering a robot with one centimeter square sensors all, all across it. And so in this project, Shadow Sense, uh, which, was, uh, which came out a few months ago, we thought, what if we, you know, if, if the skin of the robot can be soft or translucent, we can use uh, cameras inside the robot to detect touch. And so we try to see if we can, if we can consistently uh, do this. So we, you can take anything from just inflating a balloon, putting a webcam in, or having uh, sort of a, a larger robot like we have here from, a, from another project developed by Kirsten Peterson here at Cornell. So this is an inflatable robot for, for search and rescue. And so we took this inflatable robot, we put a camera in, and we basically used the, this idea of densely connected neural networks um, and, and, uh, um, and used transfer learning using you know, a previously uh, trained, um, I think it was on, on, on ImageNet. Um, so we used this, this uh, densely connected neural network to try to detect the gestures uh, that people do on the robot, whether it's a pointing gesture, a punching gesture, a pushing gesture, two-handed pushing and, and hugging, and you can see the confusion matrices. So um, a diagonal is good, so it means that you know most people who, well, in most cases where we had two hands pushing, it was detected as two hands pushing, I think there were only five, um, five uh, uh, mistaken um, classifications. And, and so I think the potential of this is, is really great because you can have a very high resolution um, touch sensor for a full body robot as long as you can make the robot um, have a somewhat of a translucent skin. So this is, this is sort of a, a new direction for a more perceptive uh, robot skin. And then lastly, on the human, on the, uh, on the human machine interaction studies side, um, I want to talk about one study that was uh, sort of surprising and interesting that we did with an economics researcher who was at Cornell and also at the Hebrew University in, in Jerusalem, Ori, Ori Hefetz. And, um, and here we looked at uh, whether, whether the robot's performance uh, can increase or decrease people's motivation to work for money. And this is actually, the, the, as far as we know, the first human robot study, well, it's, it's the first in two, in two ways. The first human robot study where we looked at a robot being a competitor of a human rather than a collaborator. Um, so reflecting more people's fears of, of robotics in, in industry, especially. And so we had the robot do the same work as the human does. And, the, and we just changed how good the robot was in, in doing the work. And also it was, as far as I know, the first work where we looked at human robot interaction where the, the experiment itself affected how much people got paid at the end. So it was a, we used an economics paradigm where we pay people according to the performance. And we kind of looked at how money affected, affects their behavior. Um, and we found this uh, kind of depressing downward, downward sloping graph is that the better the robot was, and this is controlled for the human's performance and, and controlled for, for a lot of different things, for the, for the, uh, the, the prize and et cetera, um, the better the robot performed, the less people would put in effort, uh, even though they would make the same amount of money for every, every task they did. So the robots, score um, should not have rationally changed their behavior. Uh, but as the robot was getting better, humans lost motivation to perform as well. Um, the other sad graph is the second sad graph on the right, which is that the higher the robot score, the less the humans felt that they were good at the task. We didn't ask them to compare themselves to the robot, but, they, but um, this graph sort of shows that in some sense, people do compare themselves to robots. Uh, and the better the robot was performing, the less people ranked themselves, you know, on a scale from one to seven, going from around five and, or six when the robot was not doing it that well to around, you know, three or four when the robot was doing very well. Um, so this sort of, I think, has, has, has implications on how, um, on how human robot teams would affect human performance and also the sense of self-competency when they work with robots that might be better than them at the job they, that they were doing. Um, so this is just, again, a, a recent example of the type of work that we do that's not algorithmic at all, uh, is not design-based at all, but it's only about trying to understand uh, how humans and robots interact. And 
this sort of brings me to um, the sort of any, anyway, maybe it's a good time for any questions before I get to like the longer project where I want to dig a little bit more in depth. Or if not, I'll just, I'll just do this last part and then we can have a longer discussion. So I'll, um, so the last project, which has been really one of the biggest passions of mine um, for the last few years is this um, idea of, of robots for design work. And this includes actually all three of the topics that we work on. We both design robots for it. When we think about design, it has a lot of sort of influence, uh, influential uh, reasoning in it. And we do a lot of studies with people. And so it kind of is a, it's, it's, it's a nice project in that sense that it includes all three topics that we're interested in. And the idea is this, this is our, this is, we started with this sketch four years ago. We had a, an undergraduate, Emma Cohen, do this sketch for us. Um, and it's, a, you know, an engineer at, uh, at uh, Apple or Samsung or LG de developing the new iPhone on this big like model table where she has all the components and they has, she has two robots that help her, you know, design this phone. And she has some data visualization on top that shows her how well the design would perform and the robots are trying to help her make a better design. Why do we want humans and robots to collaborate in designs? Um, they actually, humans and robots have actually very complementary skills that have to do with design. Humans are really good at, high, at big picture, high level thinking. They have common sense, intuition. They can generalize very easily from examples. All the stuff that robots are horrible at, or AI is bad at. AI is good at, at you know, just going through large data sets, uh, avoiding cognitive biases, being very methodical in the way that they search. And why not just have everything on a screen? And this is sort of um, a, a large body of work that shows that um, that uh, creative thinking especially really benefits from physical manipulation of objects. And so uh, in many, in many um, places, you will see that, that when people are trying to build something, an architect is trying to build a building, they build a scale model, they move around the model, they use the material to, uh, sometimes it's been called talk back uh, to you to, to do the design. So can robots meaning in a meaningful way help you use this material space to, um, to get to a better design? <clears throat> um, the underlying model we use is, uh, is called uh, design space exploration. Um, I'll explain it using this example of an office space. So let's say you want to design your new office. You got a new office, your new lab um, at your work. And then you decide that there's six things you care about. You, you care about how much daylight you have. You care about how many people can sit there. You care about who sits next to whom. You have six objectives here at the bottom. Uh, then you have, you have this space um, where you can put your tables, your shelves, your desks, and everything around the office. And, this is, and, and every solution here is one point in the solution space. So you make a design decision, you get a point in the solution space, which is defined by this design here on top. This point in the solution space, if you have some way of, of calculating these, so let's assume you have some way of calculating these, you can calculate a number for each of your objectives, like how good does it fit your objectives? How, you know, what's, what, is the, what, is, what is the outcome? Maybe it's like a cost function. You can visualize it like a, with a spider graph or radar graph. And then you have some model that uh, tells you for each solution, the solution space, you know, in this case, we have, you know, 12 different office layouts, how they perform in the objective space. Does this make sense? Um, yes, so only, only Oren can, add, can nod. So it has to be, make sense to you. Okay, what is the problem with this? So this is a nice model. It's, it's being used a lot in design, uh, in design automation. Um, the solution space is so vast that, I don't know if this is intuitively true to you, but if you think about it for a moment, you realize that this is much bigger than, you know, the game of Go or um, even autonomous driving, I would say. Like, the possible ways in which you can configure a single office with no other constraints is bit, it's pretty much infinite. I mean, it's not infinite, but it's, it's huge. So basically, there's no way to search the space automatically. People, like there's no, it, it's, a lot of you won't believe me, I think, especially if you come from computer science, but 
the best thing that that people do still today is genetic algorithms, which is what I learned when I was an undergrad in the 90s. Um, this kind of gets you a good a good a good enough solution, but it says you just can't search the space. And obviously, exploring it manually is also impossible. Some of you are pretty good at this. If I give you like a bunch of like toy tables and toy desks, I can, you sit there for an hour and you find a pretty good solution. Like, how do you do this? How does anybody do this? Like when you move into a new office, how do you find a solution that's, that fits your objectives so quickly? So we've been trying to look at, at this way of like, can, can we take what humans are really good at and, and take what AI is really good at and try to help people explore this space? So the first study was from a couple of years ago. So the way that we think about this, so this is the same model we see before. We have the solution space, the objective space. We have this model, which the, the computer can calculate um, and can tell you what numbers you get for each objective. The user can look at some visualization of this, of this objective um, outcome, and they can make decisions and they can decide you know, what to change. Um, the AI can look at the outcome do some sort of search on the solution space and maybe give you more information about possibilities. And there's some dialogues. So again, this is, a, this is a very high level view, but this is kind of what we, what we imagined. Um, and so we actually built this table. It took us quite a, quite a bit of time to build this uh, sort of interactive table where you can move stuff around and there's stuff projected on it at, at the bottom and you can try to solve these design problems. And we found <coughs> A very, very promising result. So here we have a graph on a, on, a, on a complex design problem that I'm not going to get into because it's a design problem that was given to us by NASA. It's a very complicated satellite design problem. So you don't have to care about what the problem is, except that we have a, two objectives. We want to have a high science benefit. So imagine the Mars rover. You have to decide what to put on the Mars rover. And you have hundreds of scientists who want you to do stuff with the Mars rover. This is the type of problem that NASA was working on. Uh, it's, it's called a mission design. Um, and you want to have, you know, you want to go to the right and have a lot of scientists be happy with the sensors you put on the Mars rover. But also you want a taxpayer to be happy and not spend too much money. So you want to be on the bottom right of this graph. So higher science benefit, cheaper. And so we had the AI explore for days, you know, the solutions. And you can see all the solutions that were found. This is the blue. So the AI searches very broadly. It doesn't really have a good idea of what it's looking for. Uh, this is using the state-of-the-art genetic algorithm that's used to solve these types of problems. Then we had a human try to solve this. Just they, they put sensors on the Mars rover and they see how much it costs and they see how many scientists are happy. And you can see the design space exploration here is the red, the red area, much more narrow, but kind of on par with the AI. Just uh, they have a much more linear relationship between, um, you know, more capabilities, more money. So they have a good sense of how to trade off money for capabilities. The one on the right, you can see it's a 10 minute collaboration between the AI and the human. And within 10 minutes, some of our participants found solutions that were better science wise and cheaper. So they were so called Pareto optimal, Pareto dominating to the best solutions that were found so far ever with the AI algorithm. Um, and so I, I know um, I don't know if you, you I, I, I gave this talk at the University of Washington a couple of years ago, and, and Sid, I think your previous advisor, we argued about this graph for for the whole time of the Q and A because he did not he thought this whole thing was fake. So we can uh, not fake, but he thought he thought it was like just a a, a fluke. But I think this is actually this to me it makes sense because some things you just can't can't automate very very well, and, and some things humans are just not very good at. Um, and I think the thing that, that, we, that I learned from this was that people are not very good of changing the, like, w the road that they're on. Like if they have some idea of what they're doing, they can move a little bit left and right, but they can't really break out of their own thinking box very quickly. This is why you see this, usually this very like narrow um, path. Uh, and I think AI is a little bit too broad. It, it doesn't really have a good direction. So it needs the humans to sort of tell, tell it like, this is complete nonsense. Like don't even, don't even go there. Um, if we look at just objective right, metrics. Back to the previous slide. Yeah. I have a better version of this coming up. I want to so. argue about it. I want to argue about it just a bit. Is, you yeah. say that people are not good at, at changing their, uh, 
initial design, but what if you bootstrap the human just with a, a solution given by the AI? So you don't look at the collaboration, but you suggest an initial design across the, the, the space of, of AI provided design. Would you get similar results? So this is a, this is kind of what this green thing is like. This is the the AI here is not really an AI. It's, it's a local search agent. So it's not exactly what you're saying. But you're saying I'm just going to take the best solution from the blue one and start there. Is that what you're saying? Even a random solution. Even a random solution. Well, the random you, solution is uh, bad. like a random solution could be this one. It's really expensive and does nothing. Like and, and, and the question is, will the human will the human do only local modifications around that, or will it drive it to the right and, and down? Great question. And this is what our next study was about. So this was kind of our first study. So objectively, I'm going to just say one sentence about this. The solutions achieved by the side-by-side, -side, the SPS, this is the collaboration, are better. Lower is better. But also the diversity was, was lower. So this is a problem. Um, people did not explore as much as they did on their own. So that with the robot, they explored less than what they explored even on their own. So with, which is, I think, an interesting psychologically, because I think people thought the robot was smart enough that they didn't have to, they were just kind of trying to follow the world. But let's, we try to dig into this a little bit, bit, little bit uh, more, where we, um, we added a robotic arm and before this was only the, like they only got recommendations from a screen because we didn't have to, but then we build a robotic arm that now works with you together on the, on the, um, and we also try to see like what happens actually in the actual human robot interaction around the space. And this, um, let me see, this is, so here we can see, Actually, I'm, I want to I want to give us at least um, 15, 10 to fifteen minutes of Q and A. So I'm going to go to just the conclusions. But I, I do recommend you to read this paper because I it's it is probably my favorite paper from the last few years. Um, and this is what we saw when we had people actually work with the robot and looked in detail about what happens in the collaboration. So first of all, people have very different styles about how they think about the robot. Some people thought about the robot as leading this interaction. And they just had to sort of like take the robot's ideas and, and improve them. Whereas others looked at the robot much more as a subordinate. So they had their idea of how they, how they progress in, in the, in the um... actually, I will show you the previous graph once just. Uh... So here we see the same thing, but now we see 12 different people um, working with the robot. The red part is what they did on their own. They have five minutes to, to work on their own. It's also for the robot to learn uh, about the human's preferences. And some people do really bad. They get stuck on the bottom left corner. Some people actually do really well. Participant seven here, they got pretty far and they explored a lot. But once the robot starts working with them, you can see how, uh, look at participant 10, for example, who, who got nowhere on their own. How one, now the robot comes in, this is the green dot. Suddenly they start exploring together a much wider space. Um, Participant two up on top, they didn't explore a much wider space, but they definitely improved. Participant three were going in a very specific direction in some sense, but then found solutions that were much cheaper, much better once the robot starts kicking in. So generally you can see the robot improves almost everybody's work, except maybe participant seven, who was doing very well on their own. Uh, but also you can see that there, that people are very, people work very differently with the robot and differently is as I said, some see the robot as a leader and others as a subordinate. So some just want the robot to help them do something that they know what they want to do. I'm going to skip the videos. More importantly, some people like people do this this work very differently. Some people just try out everything. They just they just like you know uh, trial and error. I'm going to try as many solutions as I can and see what happens. Whereas others, you know, like this participant here on the right, she has the instructions in her hands all the time. And she is very methodical. And what happened here is that people who were like more tinkering, more like prototype designers, they felt the world was slowing them down and it kept like doing stuff that they were so far beyond. It's like they were they already like, uh, they're so far beyond. Whereas the, the comprehensive ones thought the world was too fast. They thought the world kept interrupting them in their thought process. And so to try to understand like what the person is actually, how they're designing is, is really important. And I'm gonna skip this. And also, people took the robot's um, responses very personally. 
you know, this participant says, you know, I, I felt the, the robot was dismissing me because every time I did something, the robot reversed it. So you put something there, you know, the robot takes it away. And it felt like the robot didn't think they were, they were smart enough. Um, all right, so now to your question. What was your question again? Sorry. <laughs> Oh, you, you got stuck. I don't think we can hear you. Yeah, my internet connection is, is poor. Sorry about that. So my question was about uh, if we use the AI as different starting points for for the people, how that changes their, uh, so their I think future design. What's hidden beneath this is that I've shown you this two-dimensional graph. And the graph is a very, it's a very, it's, it's a projection. I mean, it's an outcome projection. Um, some of these solutions don't make, the actual design space is two to the 60th, two to the six zero. So design space itself is very large. Um, and some things just don't make sense. As soon as you see them, they don't make sense. Even if they might, be similar in objective to another solution. So selecting, a, it's very hard for the robot to select a solution that's uh, meaningful for the person. Sorry. Um, I, I think that's kind of like what's hidden in there. So selecting a random point could be completely irrelevant. It could be, it could be like three, it could be like three of the same cameras on the rover, right? Or three very similar cameras on the rover. So even though it costs, like you, you kind of, it's kind of the same as, as, as if putting one is just a little more expensive or maybe like if a person sees this, it doesn't make any sense to them. Like, like why would you do this and not like, so what, what I'm saying is the design space itself is so much, it's so large and there's so much in common sense in it that you can't encode that looking at this graph is a little bit misleading to say that these solutions are similar to each other. They're just similar in outcome. Does that make sense? So the human has to sort of intervene. So I want to sort of just show you the last um, version of this, which is uh, another design pro problem we're looking at. And here we kind of took the results from the previous study where we're saying, okay, here is um, the problem is that the, the hum humans felt the robots did not understand what they were trying to achieve. Some people wanted to save money and the robots just kept wasting money. And some people wanted to, like they didn't understand, the robot didn't understand what they were trying to do. So we asked this question, can a robot understand what the robot is trying, what, what the human is trying to do? We did this on a different uh, problem. It's a voting district problem that is a big problem in the US happening every 10 years, ex exactly now again, where politicians use, they redistrict the voting districts for their own gain. It doesn't matter. It's a political problem that as well doesn't have. So it's good, you should be happy. Um, but. Basically, you, let's say you want to design a state, it, this, divide the state into voting districts. So you want to have, I don't know, Calpiot, put them in different places in a sense that it would be fair. So first of all, what is fair? It's not clear what fair is. Should you minimize the number of wasted votes? Do you want to have as few as possible? You know, that's also a big problem as well, like wasted votes. You don't want people to vote for, for candidates that don't, uh, you know, don't get in. Do you want to make districts as normal looking as possible? Do they make sense in terms of who is together in the same district? Is fair, does fair mean that minorities are represented equally in the final outcome? Like what is fair? A lot of things could be fair. Um, so here we try to, to try, we try to sort of figure out whether a robot can figure out when you're trying to develop your districts using our, our table, whether they understand what you think is fair. The model that we use is this the dynamic base, base nets. It's basically like a temporal probabilistic model. The idea is that the designer has some beliefs about the problem. They have some intentions about the problem. They will synthesize these to create a solution that supports their intentions given their beliefs. The design solution will have outcomes, which is the fairness metrics. And then Looking at these outcomes, the person learned something about the design problem and it will update their beliefs and they will use their intentions again the next step to find a better design solution. This is how we, this is kind of based on, 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 on Mars work on, on uh, 
called evolutionary design. And the idea that design is an evolving, an evolving cycle of updating your beliefs and finding solutions that better reflect your intentions given your beliefs. If we look at this from a sort of a, a, a parametric learning perspective, um, the world somehow has some dynamics. So if you have a design solution, it gives you some outcomes. This function F is not really known to the person. It's known to the simulator, but not the person. It might be very hard for the person to understand, it might be very complex and intractable for people to understand. It gives you some reward, which, which gives the person some satisfaction about their outcomes. This is the, from the perspective of the AI. Um, the human has some beliefs about the dynamics. So this is the approximation of F. This is phi. And the person has some beliefs about the rewards. So this is even more complicated. I think people don't even know what they really want. They just know when they like something. And they use all of this to create the next design. So from the perspective of, of the of the... AI, they can see the design solutions, they can see the outcomes, they can see the next design solutions, but they don't know any of these other things. They don't know how satisfied the human is unless they have to say it every step, and they don't know what people, what the person believed is. Here we're trying to figure out, can we learn from just the outcomes and the trajectory of outcomes what the person likes, what the person thinks they like? And so... We built this, uh, we did this using, um, using sort of like a, a function approximator network, a neural network um, that looked at, at how the design objectives change over time, looked at this time sequence and tried to figure out what is the strategy or what is the preferences of, of people. Now, so the last two cents about this. Problem number one, how do you get the data for this? Do you have a million people solve the same design problem and they tell you what they want? It's pretty like it's it, that's one of the problems with all of these like human robot studies. Yeah, we, you can't collect this type of data. So what we did is we built a reinforcement learning agent that is trying to solve the same problem with the reward that the human we think the human has for each of the possible rewards that humans have, and then we use their data to learn this function approximation. <coughs> and use that function approximation to try to see if we can guess what the human is doing. Um, so what this looks like in reality is the person is playing with this map. We know what they're trying to do. They're trying to balance population and regularize shapes. And this is the, the increasingly accurate guess of what the robot is thinking they're trying to do is they're trying to increase compactness, which is true, lower the population standard deviation, but they don't care about wasted votes. So overall, if we look at what we told people to do, so we told people to like increase objective three, decrease objective two, et cetera. The predicted task scores were pretty good. They're like I would say about 70% accurate, um, depending on, on your metric. And so the summary of this is that we can do, we can, we do not badly by using a reinforcement learning agent to try to op optimize a design problem using this data to learn about the relationship between designs and intentions, and then using this learned network to guess people's intentions in a pretty accurate way. Um, and the biggest problem is, is that when you compare the agent that's trying to optimize some like fairness criteria, agents are pretty good at it. You know, they, like, they go straight for the, the good solutions. Whereas humans, it looks almost random. Like it, some people are really bad. Like you're trying to, in the, in the third row here, the human is trying to lower, lower the, I think lower the, the yellow line, uh, lower the yellow line and not care about the other two lines. It's all just like a mess. But still we're, we're able to, there's I guess some signal in here that helps us detect this. So I'm gonna stop here. Um, so we have at least five minutes for questions. I'm sorry, I went a little over. I just am really excited about this project. And um, be happy to answer any questions. And again, just to summarize, this is gonna be for, next, for the next talk. Uh, to summarize, we're trying to, to solve these problems, to try to develop better robotic technologies that help people uh, by using a combination of AI, machine learning, design methods, and de design knowledge also, and human, machine interaction studies. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions in the time we have left.
Thanks, guys, for the, the really inspiring talk. I'll uh, steal the first question, even though I asked way too many questions along the line. So a lot of times you use robot and computer or machine interchangeably. Yeah. For example, in, in, the, in the last uh, project, is there significance, and I know sometimes there is and sometimes there isn't, is there significance that the, rob the robot has a physical embodiment or could you just give the signals through a screen? Um, so, so I'd like to hear on, on that only related to the, this project. Yeah. Um, so we started with the screen, right? We started with the, the screen and the physical representation of the table. So the human was physical, was physically manipulating. The, the AI was giving recommendations. Then we did the study with the robot. And there are a lot of things that change once you have a robot interfering in your space. First of all, the, um, you know, the robot is kind of like in your space. It's, it's, it's a little bit more um, on the same level as you in the way that it can affect the design. So there's uh, more of a sense that, that both of you are kind of, that you have the same tools at your disposal. Um, and then also there was a lot of sort of like negotiation, like when does the robot move? When does the robot not move? So there's, I, I don't wanna answer your question of whether we need a robot or not, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that it matters if it's a robot or not. And from a perspective of a researcher, I care about whether it's a robot that helps you think through things um, what other things you have to take into consideration? So I think it's an interesting problem. I don't know if it's an important problem. Um, and again, uh, everything went online for the last year and a half. So we kind of had to give up all of our robots experiments and just move to, to going back to screens and our latest projects were all on screens. Um, but we just started, you know, this personal ideation robot. So people are trying to, to uh, come up with a design and the robot helps you by moving your, your notes around and organizing them in space. So, so again, we, we have to get back to this. It's an open question. I, I don't have a strong argument for it, but I do think that there's interesting questions that come up once the robot is physically embodied. Thanks. I, I have another question. Um, so, so in the last uh, project you showed with the voting districts, yeah. 